So welcome to week seven. This week we're going to be talking about some issues in scientific publishing. I'm also going to do a couple of demo edits for you on the first paper that you turned in. So that will give me a chance to review and practice with you some of the skills that we learned in the first four weeks of this course. In this first module I'm going to talk about the topic, the issue of plagiarism. So of course uh, all of you I'm sure are familiar with the concept of plagiarism. It's basically when you're trying to pass off some other person's writing or also potentially some artwork or tables and figures, trying try to pass it off as your own. And uh, of course uh, everybody's aware that you shouldn't plagiarize and I think most students have a pretty good concept of plagiarism at sort of a high level. Uh, where sometimes it gets murky is in the particulars, you know, when, when it comes down to exactly what constitutes plagiarism, sometimes students are confused. So I want to try to bring some clarity to that in the lecture today and just give you some examples. But again, uh, you're plagiarizing if you're trying to pass off somebody else's writing as your own. So if you're going to use somebody else's writing, of course, you'll want to put it in quotation marks and properly cite it. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. And again, a lot of students kind of understand that if you copy, cut and paste a whole chunk of an article that that's plagiarism. But um, it can be more subtle than that. So uh, cutting and pasting a sentence or even a part of a sentence from another source and putting that into your own work as if you've written that, that's plagiarism. Taking somebody else's work and cutting and pasting it and then slightly rewriting it or rearranging the words a little bit, that's plagiarism. So it's not okay to simply, you know, rewrite something else a little bit uh, and rearrange their words. You really need to start fresh and write your own words. So start from scratch. And of course, things like borrowing material from sites like Wikipedia, that's also not okay. So uh, let me give you an example here. So I, I, I made this example up, but I took us a, a passage from Wikipedia and then I showed how a student might plagiarize it. So uh, the, this was on Ernest Hemingway. It says, Ernest Miller Hemingway was an American author and journalist. His economical and understated style had a strong influence on 20th century fiction, while his life of adventure and his public image influenced later generations. So, so again, that's from Wikipedia. Now um, this is a made up example, but imagine a student then takes that work and says, okay, well, I'm going to just change it around a little bit and pass it off as my own work. So you, the, a plagiarized version would be, Ernest Hemingway's thrifty and understated style. Notice that, again, I made this example up, but uh, I went to the thesaurus and took economical and said, oh, well, a, th a th synonym for economical is thrifty, so I'll, I'll change that one thing. Uh, Ernest Hemingway's thrifty and understated style strongly influenced 20th, 20th century fiction. So I changed a few words there, but you can see it's still the original author's work. This is his or her words, not mine. And I've changed a few things, but that doesn't make it my work. And then I uh, made another little change. I separated that second thought out into a second sentence. And then I put, instead of his life of adventure, I put his audacious lifestyle. So I rearranged it to his adventurous lifestyle, and then I went and found a synonym for adventurous. So I put his audacious lifestyle and public image also influenced later generations. So you can see I made a few little changes to that, but it's not my own work. It's not my own thoughts. I could have rewritten that without having any, any understanding of Hemingway or what a thrifty and understated style means or what his lifestyle really was. So that's plagiarism. So it's not okay to simply just kind of rearrange the words a little bit. That still constitutes plagiarism. Now you can imagine a student going to Wikipedia who has to write a report on Hemingway. If they only go to Wikipedia and try to re write that report, they're not going to be able to do much better than plagiarism, right? In order to be able to write about Hemingway, I've got to go to enough sources so that I can figure out about his style and his lifestyle uh, in order to be able to be to write about him. So I have to understand Hemingway enough in order to be able to generate new prose about him. And that's what you need to do to avoid plagiarism. So when you're writing about others' ideas or work or you're writing from sources, you need to understand the material well enough. You need to go back and digest it so that you can put it in your own words. This means you're probably going to need to go to multiple sources, really understand what they're saying in order that you can put it completely in your own words. So you really want to start from scratch. You want to work from memory. So 
uh, while it's okay to sort of cut and paste material into your roadmap or your outline as you're collecting material before you write in the pre-writing step, when you then go to write, you need to synthesize and digest all of that material and start afresh, work from memory, not just simply rearrange somebody else's words. You need to draw your own conclusions. You really have to understand the material yourself, draw your own conclusions. Why should you trust that the person who happened to write that in Wikipedia knows what they're talking about? Um, you're comp if you're just plagiarizing their ideas, you're completely trusting that they completely understand Hemingway and have got it right. So you need to really go to multiple sources and make your own conclusions about Hemingway or whatever topic you're writing on. Again, you can't simply just mimic the original author's sentence structures or just rearrange the original author's words. That's still plagiarism. Another thing that students often are uh, less aware of is that there's a concept called self-plagiarism. So recycling your own writing or data from one published paper to the next, that constitutes self-plagiarism and that's also uh, misconduct. That's also a no-no. So um, this would be things like Say you've published a paper, you copy a whole chunk of that paper and put it into a new paper, or you slightly rewrite the text from the old paper. The problem is that if you're just rehashing old material, why are you even publishing a new paper at all? Uh, the, uh, if you have to rehash completely old material, that means you don't have anything new to say. So it, you cannot copy your previously published text. And uh, of course also there's the issue of that, that that text is now copyrighted and owned by the journal, uh, the, the published text, so it's not okay to use it again as well. So you actually cannot uh, plagiarize from your own work. And there's a, you know, there are some small exceptions to this in the sense of uh, sometimes the experimental method section of a paper. You may have done one experiment that m yields many different data sets that you then write several papers about. And so some of the experimental methods from those papers may overlap. So if there is some repetitive material in the text of the experimental methods, it should not be a complete copy or should, it should not be huge uh, chunks of text that are copied. But if some of the materials uh, and methods you explain in the same way in multiple papers, journal editors are usually fine with that. Uh, but you don't want to take whole sections out of your introduction section and just copy those. You actually need to start afresh and write new. Otherwise, again, why are you writing a new paper? Authors sometimes also engage in something that's not exactly plagiarism, but it's sort of similar and related, and that's duplication of their o old results and their old data. So sometimes an author will take something that's already published, a data set that's already published, and maybe add a little bit of new data to it and present the whole thing as completely new data. So that's a no-no because then it's you're putting two things in the medical literature, two pieces of evidence, as if they're two independent pieces of evidence, and they're not. Uh, of course, you're also just padding the medical literature with extra material that's, you know, a paper that's not necessary. So, uh, so you don't want to do that. Uh, you also don't want to submit the same data set or overlapping data sets to multiple journals at once. Uh, journal editors often will catch that and sometimes the reviewer <laughs> for one journal is the same reviewer as for the other journal in these kinds of you know topics which there's you know certain experts in the field so that can get caught and um, again that there's no reason that there should be multiple publications that should all be in a single publication so you want to also avoid self plagiarism in this kind of duplication and journals are becoming more savvy to all of this it's becoming easier to detect this kinds of things now in the digital age. So uh, a number of journals are using software that's been specifically developed to detect both plagiarism and self-plagiarism and duplication. It's very easy if you're looking for this kind of thing, if you're on the lookout for it, it's fairly easy to detect uh, plagiarism. And the way the software works is it's looking for a lot of similarity between uh, the newly submitted paper and other papers that are already out there in their database. And now journals are using this type of software to screen papers. Uh, authors are now trying to go back and systematically say, well, how much plagiarism is there in the literature? Even if you don't have access to sophisticated software like that, it, in fact, it's actually fairly easy to uh, catch plagiarism simply by uh, using Google or another search engine 
So uh, when I'm, I, I've had a few instances where I've been trying to sleuth out some plagiarism, and uh, the way to do it is you take a sentence from the material that you think is plagiarized, you put it in quotes and put that in Google, and if it, Google returns to you that same sentence in another paper, it's almost certainly plagiarized because by the time you get a string of seven to ten words, it's very unlikely that two people independently will come up statistically, it's very unlikely that the two people will come up with the exact same string of seven or ten words. By the time you get to a string of seven or ten words, the chance that somebody else is going to put those together in the exact same configuration is actually very low. So you can pretty easily detect plagiarism just using Google, and I've done it a few times. Um, you know, I had a case where uh, a, somebody asked me to edit a review article. Now, she hadn't written the review article. She had solicited it. She had commissioned it. Um, but it needed some work on the prose, so I went to work on editing it. And I got through about three pages. I sort of got a sense of the author's style. Uh, I got to the fourth page, and the style kind of changed abruptly, and it was kind of confusing. It was all of a sudden this new material, so I was confused. And the author had cited a source. So I said, oh, I'll go to the source and see if I can sort out what this person is talking about. So I went to the source, and it was a clearly cited source, and uh, pulled up the source and realized that uh, almost a page of material had been just lifted verbatim from that source and dropped into this review article. So I was a bit confused. I thought, well, maybe they had intended to kind of set it off and put quotation marks around it, but they hadn't. So was this, you know, uh, just an oversight? Uh, but it seemed to be a case of plagiarism. So then I got curious, and I started going through the rest of the paper, sort of, sort of doing some sleuthing here. So I took some sentences from the rest of the paper, would put them in Google, and sure enough, I popped up uh, all sorts of plagiarism going on in this paper. So the you know, I pop in one sentence, it pulls up one paper. So they basically had taken a sentence from one paper, two sentences from another paper, a couple sentences from another paper. So they had really gone through the literature and just kind of stole sentences here and there and put them all together into this completely plagiarized uh, article. So I had to go back to the person and luckily, again, she hadn't written it and just say, well, you know, this is, is a plagiarized paper. So it does occur and if you're looking for it, it's actually fairly easy to detect. Uh, people have actually tried to go through the literature and figure out exactly how prevalent is plagiarism in the scientific literature. It's not that easy of a question to answer because uh, this, uh, this software uh, that will detect plagiarism, it does a fairly good job, but then you need to go in a lot of times and check manually to really verify cases. So it takes some work. And uh, But in there was an editorial in Nature where they talked about some publishers had used a particular plagiarism detection software, done some pilot studies, and they found uh, in, in submitted manuscript that manuscripts about 6 to 23 percent of the papers had some kind of plagiarism or self-plagiarism in them that they had to uh, then go out and immediately reject those papers. So 6 to 23 percent is, is not low. I mean, it's not huge, but it's a, you know, it's a fairly um, high percentage. It's kind of a surprisingly high percentage, I think. Uh, another study that just was published recently, a two-year study of plagiarism in the Croatian Medical Journal, they used some automatic detection software and then they manually confirmed these. So uh, these were in s papers submitted to the journal. Eight percent of the papers uh, had, had plagiarized other people's work and about three percent were self-plagiarized. So again, we're ranging around a, you know, ten percent uh, of the papers having significant plagiarism in there. So this is um, rampant enough that journal editors are quite worried about it. Um, it doesn't just apply to the scientific literature. Of course, there's a larger dialogue going on about plagiarism in academics because, of course, now with everything being online, it's fairly easy to cut and paste. So um, another group of researchers did a study of plagiarism in the personal statements for residency applications. So these are doctors who are applying to do their residency, and they were applying to do residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a very prestigious institution. So the researchers on this paper used a plagiarism detection software to go through about 5,000 personal statements from these applications. And then they confirmed um, the suspected plagiarism manually. So about 5% of essays had pretty clear evidence of plagiarism in it. So about 1 in 20 of the doctors applying for this prestigious residency had plagiarism. So it, it's, it is a significant problem. 
I'm just going to give you uh, a, an example of another example of plagiarism that I happen to come across just to show you that this does happen in the literature. Um, this is a pretty blatant case of plagiarism, um, but it made it into the medical literature in um, uh, the, the plagiarized paper made it in 2002. How I happened upon this paper, I was doing a, a paper of my own on um, the use of oral, contracept oral contraceptives of estrogen to treat uh, young women uh, with bone loss due to eating disorders. And so I was reading sort of all of the papers on this subject, and especially all of the randomized trials on this subject, and there were very, there weren't so many, so I, and I had all the papers out on this subject. And I was reading this paper, uh, this 1995 paper, and they had found a negative result. That is that the estrogen, the oral contraceptives, did not help the bones of women with anorexia nervosa. So they, in their discussion, were talking about multiple ex potential explanations of why the estrogens were not effective. And so they listed them with numbers. They said one possibility is this, the second possibility is this, a third possibility is this, and a fourth and likely explanation is this. And somehow that kind of stuck in my head. So days later, I was reading through some other papers, and I kind of got a sense of deja vu. I was reading through the discussion section of another paper, and I was, and they had this numbered explanations. One possibility is, the second is, the third is. And so it struck me as very familiar. And I'm like, I think I read this already. So I went back and kind of dug out the original paper, the 1995 paper, and put the two papers side by side. And sure enough, it was some pretty blatant plagiarism. So this is the original paper, the passage that appeared in the original paper. Here's what the um, plagiarized paper changed. So the, uh, this was a 2002 paper in a different journal. And they basically took the original passage, the original paragraph that was in uh, the 1995 paper, and they made just the following changes that I'm showing you on the screen. That's all they changed. So uh, they say one possibility is that the dose of estrogen effective in treating postmenopausal women, that was the original, they changed it to that the estrogen dose, which is, they added a which is, uh, they changed a can to a may, they changed a duration of time longer to a longer period of time. <laughs> the funny thing is they crossed out the third explanation and they, you know, only made three explanations. So they changed the fourth to a third and more likely. So they thought, well, you know, we'll get rid of one of the explanations. And, you know, again, certainly this is a clear case of plagiarism and that's not sufficient in any way uh, to, that they haven't put it in their own words at all. It's all the original author's ideas. Now, uh, to be fair, this 2002 paper was coming from a foreign language, um, for, from a foreign country. And so um, it's very likely, and my guess is, that the authors um, weren't confident in their writing of English. And so they took that original paper and just said, well, well you know, since they, the, both studies were both similar, they were randomized trials of women with anorexia nervosa, they were extremely similar in design. So I think they just said, well, you know, we'll kind of use that as a template, that original paper as a template, and just kind of write over it and add our own data. Of course, that's not fine, and that doesn't excuse it, but I, I'm guessing that that's probably the origin of it. Um, anyway, so quite, quite a blatant case, and then these cases do happen, and they make it in the literature. Hopefully, uh, with better detection software, we'll see less of this in the future. Uh, just a couple more examples. So after I went and I saw that, that those two paragraphs almost matched exactly, then, of course, I got really curious, and I read, you know, compared the two papers side by side. And uh, pretty much the 2002 paper was a complete copy. I mean, almost everything was copied from the 1995 paper. So here's a few more examples. Um, so the, this was the you know, concluding sentence. You know, in the first paper, they say, our data demonstrate that despite its usefulness in perimenopausal women, estrogen and progestin administration does not reverse the profound osteopenia seen in all young women with anorexia nervosa. Trabecular bone loss is severe and may progress despite estrogen therapy. So the plagiarized passage just changes, again, just a few little things. In conclusion, our data demonstrate that despite its usefulness in perimenopausal women, you know, estrogen and progestin administration does not reverse the profound osteopenia. It's almost identical. They, they did uh, change anorexia nervosa to AN. They dropped in an acronym there, but pretty much it's exactly the same. So uh, I, I'll give you one more example of this. I'll leave this to for those of you who are curious to compare the two on your own, but you can see that it's a pretty clear case of, of straight plagiarism. So these things do happen. Uh, they do get caught. Um, I want to give one last example, which is a little bit more subtle. And to be fair, I think uh, probably was unintentional or the authors didn't really think of it as plagiarism. 
and I don't think that they plagiarized anything else in their paper. Uh, but I was reading a paper, a 2009 paper, and I came across this sentence, recent registry-based and hospital-based studies have documented a statistically significant increased risk of melanoma after breast cancer with standardized incidence ratios ranging from 1.4 to 2.7. And so that was the um, original, uh, that was the, um, the, the paper that I was reading. This is the plagiarized uh, paper. And I actually wanted to know more about those numbers, the 1.4 to 2.7. I wanted to know exactly where those came from. I wanted to dig back to the primary literature. So I uh, started to look at the references of the, pa the 2009 paper. And their fifth reference, which isn't in this sentence, actually is not referenced here, but it's referenced in the next sentence. Their fifth reference, when I got to it, I saw the exact same sentence. So the original paper, the 2004 paper said, although earlier registry-based analyses of second ne neoplasms after breast cancer did not detect an increased risk, there's a little bit kind of an introductory clause here, but then we get the exact same sentence. Several recent, recent registry-based and hospital-based studies have documented a statistically significant increased risk of uh, melanoma after breast cancer with standardized incidence ratios ranging from 1.4 to 2.7. So it's an exact copy. Uh, and, you know, and also the uh, the references one two three and four are also an exact copy. Interestingly, uh, they didn't copy uh, reference number uh, five for whatever reason. But uh, you might think I'm being a little nitpicky here. Well, okay, so they copied a sentence, you know. And and again, I I didn't find any evidence of plagiarism in the rest of the paper. And of course, I got curious and I did look for that. Uh, but but this is still plagiarism, and and it's problematic um, not only because it's a copy. You know, again, maybe the authors just lifted it and they intended to change it and they forgot. Or, uh, but but what's more, it's sort of insidious and problematic here is that I I can pretty much guess that the authors of the second paper didn't bother to go back to references one, two, three, or four. They just trusted that the authors of the 2004 paper had got this completely right and had summarized those numbers, 1.4 to 2.7, completely right. And as I've mentioned before, that's not a good assumption to make you're trusting that those other authors got it perfect and that they've summarized those four references and you need to really go back to those four references and make your own conclusions on them because otherwise that leads to all the kinds of problems that I talked about with references um, being cited and poorly propagated through the literature. So uh, again, I want to emphasize, you know, go back to your own research, uh, own original primary literature, the primary article, do the research, synth synthesize everything on your own, write it de novo on your own. Don't just simply uh, lift even ideas from other people or you know other people's synthesis of things. Don't trust that they've necessarily got it right. And of course, certainly you don't want to lift uh, the exact language as well. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.